We wanted to provide physical evidence for other people to witness that would provide in a scientific way actual proof of life after death. This group of mediums and investigators claim to have recorded their conversations with the dead. We had a thousand hours of continuous communication with the spirit world. Emily, when did you live on the earth? Oh, a long time ago now. 19th century? Yes. Is this really the voice of the deceased? The Skoll experiment continued for five years. It involved a huge range of remarkable phenomena, was witnessed by hundreds of visitors and was monitored by a team of internationally renowned scientists and investigators. We were touched by the spirits, we saw a whole range of phenomena which could not be mistaken by three investigators such as ourselves. Although the remarkable events at Skoll were widely reported in the press and in a popular book, this is the first time the Skoll Group have allowed their work to be shown in a full-length documentary. The accepted scientific view is that nothing survives death. But for well over a century, many scientists have been investigating evidence that consciousness not only survives the death of the body, but that it can communicate with the living. If you take all the phenomena within the whole of the Skoll experiment, it ranks among the most profound pieces of evidence for the existence of an afterlife. In the mid-1990s, in the tiny English village of Skoll, one of the most remarkable experiments ever attempted in communication with the dead took place in the cellar of this house. The Skoll experimental group consisted of two mediums, Diana and Alan Bennett, as well as organizers and investigators, Robin and Sandra Foy. In this quiet, secluded cellar, the Bennets would go into trance, allowing what they claimed were the voices of the dead to speak through them. But the Skull Group went far beyond this and pushed the boundaries of what can be achieved in a special area of claimed spirit communication known as physical mediumship. There's a wide range of phenomena that physical mediumship over the centuries has been supposedly able to produce. Uh, objects levitating, chairs, tables, objects in the room, apports and teleportation, in other words, things just dropping out of nowhere, sometimes things disappearing and reappearing, apparent spirit hands, apparent spirit forms, things that people can see happening. There's an effect on real objective things based on, supposedly, the communication or contact between a medium and the spirit world. The spirits are using the medium as a conduit to cause these events to happen. Physical mediumship is entirely different from mental mediumship because everybody that's present at the time can witness what's happening. Such as if a voice comes from mid-air, everybody can hear and converse with the voice. Very nice. Nice of you to have us here. If a spirit person manifests, everybody can see what happens. I think it's fair to say that when you have sittings with physical groups as successful as the Skoll Group, you will see miracles. You see things which cannot be explained under normal laws of science. Robin and Sandra Foy, who organised the Skoll experiment, are two of the world's leading experts in the field of physical mediumship. The Skoll Group was one of many groups the Foy's had formed in their decades of experimenting with afterlife communication. Dinah and Alan Bennett have also been participating in physical mediumship for many years and in 1992 joined the Foy's to form the Skoll Experimental Group. According to the Foy's, it was the exceptional mediumship abilities of the Bennett's that made the greatest contribution to the Skoll Experiment's spectacular success. 
Never in the history of mediumship had such a huge range of phenomena been reliably and repeatedly produced for such an extended period in front of so many witnesses and scientific investigators. The physical phenomena included levitations, orbs of light that could pass through solid matter, the mysterious appearance of images on sealed photographic film and videotape, and the materialization and dematerialization of solid objects and even spirit forms. But perhaps the most remarkable of all were the claimed communications between the experimenters and a group of deceased personalities. I think the greatest effort come from the spirit side. I mean, without them, you can sit there and nothing will happen. But a great deal did happen, and according to the Skoll Group, this success was due to the combined efforts of talented mediums and a group of discarnate personalities they claim were orchestrating events from the other side. They called this group the Spirit Team. Our Spirit Team was a team of spirit personalities who had lived a life on this earth um, several of them had been scientists whilst they were here. Uh, they all came together so that we could work together to achieve this aim of producing physical phenomena. We didn't honestly know uh, what to expect. We threw the whole thing open to the spirit team to allow them to develop and produce whatever phenomena they wanted to produce. The Skoll Group and researchers said they were able to conduct extensive conversations with this group of spirits through a process called transmediumship. In this specialised form of mediumship, the dead can speak to the living, it is claimed, by using the larynx of the entranced medium. When the voices came through the mediums, which they normally did, um, the voices were quite different from those of the mediums themselves. And the personalities behind the voices were not only quite different, but were very consistent. Even the accents were. Thank you for your warm appreciation of what we're trying to do. It was very easy to recognize the female one because there was only one, and she was very, very idiosyncratic. This communicator identified herself as the spirit of a Mrs. Emily Bradshaw. The Skull Group recorded hundreds of hours of conversations with Mrs. Bradshaw and other spirit team members. Emily, when did you live on the earth? Oh, a long time ago now. 19th century? Yes. And Mrs. Bradshaw, who was a very commanding figure, um, a lady of um, you know, the upper class Victorian or Edwardian lady. Well, she sounded like that. We continue from our side of life to influence people still in the body. She would tell us what was going to happen. She would comment on what we were doing and sometimes what we were thinking. She would answer our questions quite frequently before we'd actually asked them, uh, which was quite embarrassing sometimes. It's easier just to think of these influences coming, really, to aid you, mm -hmm. because they're the only ones we're interested in, really, aren't we, at the end of the day? It becomes very natural, purely and simply, because it's the same as you talking to me here in this room at this very moment. Um, there's no difference, other than the fact that we are aware that they're no longer in this world. The Skull Group claim that, in addition to Mrs Bradshaw, other personalities regularly communicated via the mediums. One of these was Patrick McKenna, who told the group he had died in 1942. We had Patrick, uh, the defrocked Irish priest that came through. He seemed to come through when we need lifting up a little bit, you know. Things sometimes were a little tense and it was Patrick's uh, job to be there and to get everyone in a joyful mood. Good evening to you. Hello, Patrick. Hello, Patrick. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I've never heard such a commotion before. <laughs> <laughs> such a carrying on. <laughs> no, it's all right. I'm only joking. He told us that he had his problems in his life and the church had um, become quite unhappy with him. 
Another personality that the Skull Group say spoke frequently through the mediums called himself Edwin. The most destructive fear of all is fear of the unknown. And finally, Raji, who claimed to have once lived in India. And who really contributed to the joyousness of the affair, because it was quite a jolly affair. Uh, Raji, good evening. Good afternoon. <laughs> Talk free. And this will help enormously. As Mr. Robin was saying, you must, you must, uh, you must... What was he saying? <laughs> <laughs> I'd ask me, I've forgotten already, Raji. Right? <laughs> yes, well, whatever it was he was saying, you must do it. <laughs> and there were one or two others who played more or less important part as different experiments were conducted. And when we had experiments which required expertise in a particular area, photographic area and so on, apparently there were different experts available. And others other drop-ins, as we called them, personalities that would just purely drop in and say hello and introduce themselves. For the Skull Group and their guests, communicating with the spirit team became so common over the course of the five-year experiment that the participants said they developed extremely close relationships with these personalities. Emily Bradshaw featured for many hundreds of hours and, like many of the others, she became so dear to us that she was literally extended family. And we viewed them, all of them eventually, as part of our family. Well, I hope you've all enjoyed your experience. Tremendous. You'll all take something away of the, the spirit of these experiments and the love that we all feel for you. But what is it like for the mediums to have these supposedly discarnate communicators speak through them? Those sensations, to me, uh, become more and more intense and build up to a point where I feel the personality actually taking part of my senses over. I become more and more unaware of my own body and also more and more unaware of my own thoughts. And then it's just, it's just very gradually done. It's, it's very beautifully done really, I think, that it's almost just like you're edged out with your full permission, of course. The Skoll experiment began in 1993, ran for five years and consisted of 500 sessions, each lasting two hours. Nearly all of them took place in this tiny brick cellar, affectionately called the Skoll Hole. Practitioners of physical mediumship believe that the best results are obtained if sessions are conducted in complete darkness. Because the reputation of physical mediumship has been severely tainted in the past by numerous hoaxers who used darkness to hide fraudulent activities, the Skull Group devised a number of controls to help eliminate this possibility. One of these controls involved all participants wearing luminous wristbands. These bands were attached with Velcro so they could not be removed without obviously attracting attention. Luminous tabs were placed on all unsecured objects in the room, as well as on the tabletop. This ensured that any movement in the room would be instantly visible to anyone. Additionally, everything that happened in this cellar was recorded on over a thousand hours of audio tape. According to the Skull Group, their spirit communicators requested that they place this empty glass dome on their table. This, they were told, would apparently help facilitate physical phenomena manifesting in the room. It was around this table that the Skull Group would attempt to open a bridge between the living and the dead. But just how difficult was it to summon the departed? There is an awful lot of effort involved. 
in, in working up to a situation where you can experience physical phenomena on a regular basis? I think possibly we sat about twice a week for a year before we really got anything significant happen, you know, just minor phenomena up to then. But the group's determination and patience paid off. By 1995, visitors were reporting that the skull hole was alive with extraordinary phenomena. Because most skull experiments took place in complete darkness, skeptics were critical of the fact that investigators were not permitted to use infrared light and cameras to monitor their sessions. However, the skull group claimed that their spirit communicators insisted upon this, since to them, infrared was as powerful as visible light and would apparently hamper their efforts. The energies that they were using were extremely subtle energies and would have suffered if any artificial light had been introduced into the room. The same was true, they said, for electric currents of any kind, though they conceded the need for small recording devices and reluctantly accepted them. We were told that this phenomena could be developed in the light, but if it were, it would take an awfully long time to produce, years and years, rather than a few months that it actually took us. Well, darkness isn't darkness to the spirit people. It was just like daylight to them in the room whilst we were in darkness, as it were. The spirit team did, however, promise to bring their own light and, in due course, apparently did just that. Before long, the Skull Group and their visitors were treated to spectacular acrobatic displays of glowing spheres they called spirit lights. <laughs> They were various shapes, generally like a pea-sized light, and it had substance. They would come and sit on your hand, and you could feel them. They were intelligently directed and intelligently moving and would be responsive to our wishes, whether expressed or silent. The gyrations were sometimes so rapid that it almost left like a, a circle of light going over here and over there. Sometimes two lights would appear and just stare at me within inches of my eyes. I thought at first that the lights must be small light-emitting diodes suspended on the end of nylon fishing line. Then suddenly a light would start to do a tap dance on, on the table, bouncing up and down on the table, and you could hear it click as it rebounded from the table. And suddenly it went pop, went through the table and came out the other side. Now, no nylon fishing line um, explanation would account for it going through a table. The lights also had another rather strange trick up their sleeve, if I may talk about lights as having sleeves, and that was to pass through bodies. I was actually used as a guinea pig in the early days um, to see how it, how it felt and, and to develop the phenomena, uh, and this light would actually enter through my chest, could be seen by everybody as it did so, um, would stay inside me for up to three minutes, and I could feel the light moving around in every part of my body. It felt rather like a butterfly internally, and then three minutes later it would pop out of the arm or something and disappear across the room. This was being developed to produce a healing phenomena. I have this bad knee, and at one point we had a light that was moving around the room and rested on my knee for a minute and suddenly moved inside my knee. Yeah, she just went into my bad knee. I could feel it moving around in my knee and then all of a sudden shot out the back of my leg and took off. The pain was greatly reduced and the swelling that had been in it that day was gone and, and that was a huge, wonderful thing to happen. We were never sure exactly what the lights were except, because obviously we asked questions about it, except that they were animated spirits, but they weren't, as it were, fully formed. They weren't um, discarnate entities as we understand them. Uh, they were somewhere in between. Objects do not just appear out of thin air, but this is exactly what numerous visitors to Skoll reported. People would see and especially hear these objects apparently materialise out of nowhere and then fall onto the floor or the table. In the language of physical mediumship, these objects are called apports. An apport is an object 
um, which is quite solid, which is brought from one location to another during an experimental session. But in so doing, and this can be from many miles distant, apparently passes through solid walls, doors, etc. Well, the total number of apports that we had um, during the experimental sessions was about 80 or even more. When we had seven sitters in the group, um, there would be seven apports appear as presents. We had three ladies, four gentlemen at that time. The apports would reflect that because there would be four things that were suitable for gentlemen, three things suitable for ladies. This is a, an apport which arrived during the earliest days of our skull experiment. In fact, it's a very small object. And whilst we were sitting here, this object would arrive, just materialise, and arrive on the table. But as it arrived, that's the sort of noise it would make. The Skull Group and the investigators observed that most apported objects, no matter how small or light, made just as loud a noise when they arrived. By far the most astonishing of the apports to appear at Skull were these newspapers, which arrived in pristine condition, despite having originated in the 1940s. In one session, a voice claiming to be a deceased British medium, Helen Duncan, described how in 1944 she was arrested and imprisoned under the archaic British Witchcraft Act. Even though British Prime Minister Winston Churchill was critical of the trial, the court imposed a nine-month sentence. After her release, Duncan continued to be hounded by the police until her death in 1956. As she described her ordeal to the group, this newspaper allegedly appeared out of nowhere. To their astonishment, displayed prominently on its front page was the story of Duncan's trial and conviction. I think she suffered greatly for her mediumship and um, she was really coming to wish us well and she bought the newspaper as a sign of a very turbulent time in her life. Since an old newspaper could theoretically be copied and printed onto modern paper, Montague Keane had the apported newspaper analysed. We took it to the leading research station in England, indeed in the world, on paper and printing, and it was absolutely clear from their report that first of all it was done on letterpress, which has gone out of uh, existence virtually since the early 1970s, I would say. It was newsprint produced during wartime, which lacked certain chemicals, which you couldn't get hold of. So this was a genuine article which appeared 50 years after the event, and no one has been able to explain how it got there. So where did all these apported objects supposedly come from? We were told by the spirit team that they were never stolen. Um, but were basically objects that had been lost or discarded or at one time been owned by the, the spirit personality that brought them for us. Well, I think the apples were brought to us as a demonstration, as an example of what is possible. If we give spirit the right conditions, you could almost say anything's possible. The next phase of the Skull experiment involved photography. These sessions began conventionally enough with the foys loading a film into a camera and placing it on the table. But after this, things began to get very strange. We heard the camera moving round over our heads, clicking and being wound on by spirit. In total darkness, so that in, in reality, nothing should have showed up on the film. But when the film was developed, there were amazing pictures. Wartime pictures of St Paul's, of a bus that was blown apart in the Blitz in Coventry, and pictures of various places, temples, various people, quite amazing stuff. It was never explained to us exactly why we got these particular pictures, other than the fact that we had a separate photographic spirit team working with us at that stage who were practicing their art and seeing what they could achieve. 
Some films contained images of faces, including human faces, apparently in various stages of formation. There were a series that appeared to represent bubbles and various other things coming together, partial faces, etc. We were told that what we were seeing were areas of communication within the spirit world. The Skull Group believed these faces were images of deceased people which were somehow projected from the other side. To them, this theory was confirmed with the appearance on another Skull film of this blurry profile. Communicators through the mediums informed them it belonged to a man named Kingsley Fairbridge, who had died in 1924. We were put in touch in a very obscure way with his daughter, who was happy to agree that that was a picture of her father. In the next experiments, the Skull Group claimed to have been able to create these photographic images not only in total darkness, but without the use of a camera. We were asked by the spirit team to put a totally unopened Polaroid 35mm film just in its plastic container on the table during our sessions. At the end of the, the session, if the spirit team felt that they'd achieved a result, we were asked to develop it. As the film was Polaroid, it could be developed immediately in a special processing machine. You can imagine how surprised when we brought this film up that had never been opened, put it through the processor and viewed it, and there was images and faces and writing. How do you explain it was there, you know? I selected the film, checked the box, which was factory sealed, identifiable by the glue marks. This contained another sealed container and after checking the film I then resealed the plastic container with uh, an identifiable mark which was my signature. During the session he placed this film on the table next to the glass dome. Substitution of the film would have been difficult to achieve since everyone present wore luminous wristbands. I'm a hundred percent certain that the film I selected was the same film that was returned to me at the end of the session. The film was immediately processed in front of him. The first few frames, there, it, there was nothing on there, it was blank, completely blank. But um, halfway along the film, we could see a Latin statement. The spirit team had said that they'd worked on the film and that they produced something for us, and lo and behold, there it was. Since the events at Skoll were so bizarre and unusual, the group knew that without careful, independent scrutiny, their experiments would probably be dismissed as a hoax. Therefore, the Foys and Bennetts allowed their experiments to be rigorously monitored by a team of internationally renowned scientists, as well as veteran paranormal investigators who were members of the Society for Psychical Research, or SPR, based in London. For over a century, the SPR has specialized in examining paranormal phenomena in an unbiased and scientific way. Among its members and past presidents have been some of Britain's most accomplished scientists, including a dozen Nobel laureates. The Society for Psychical Research has an extraordinarily um, notorious reputation for being scientifically rigorous and many people consider that it goes overboard in its scepticism. In 1995, the SPR investigators began an exhaustive two-year investigation into Skoll. By 1999, they had published their findings in this detailed report. One of its authors and a leading researcher into Skoll was the late Montague Keane, an SPR member since the 1940s, Keane was a veteran investigator of paranormal claims. We consider that extraordinary things do require a much higher level of authenticity than would normally be required for things within the scientific paradigm. Initially, we were all pretty sceptical because what had been claimed seemed so way out. 
Another key researcher was the late Dr. Arthur Ellison, an emeritus professor of electrical engineering and a former president of the SPR. When a second-rate scientist says that this could not possibly happen, and many do in connection with the paranormal, uh, they are saying, in effect, that our current set of scientific models are the last word. And it would be ridiculous to say that. Scientific theories, descriptions, change all the time, and we must expect that to continue. The third principal investigator was research psychologist Dr David Fontana. Also a past president of the SPR, Professor Fontana has authored several books about life after death and is also a leading investigator into paranormal claims. The paranormal is that mysterious area behind the seen and the known world. And since most of the world is unseen and unknown and most of the world is full of mystery, for me it's a fascinating and absorbing area. To preclude the possibility of fraud, investigators made thorough inspections of the cellar and all its contents, in full light, before and after sessions. At no time did they find any equipment or devices that could have been used for hoaxing. All participants had to empty their pockets and leave all belongings outside. The cellar had only one entrance and this door was kept locked during all sessions. Despite these strict precautions, remarkable phenomena continued unabated and the attending investigators were stunned by what they saw. One could not mistake what we saw. We saw coloured lights, we saw materialisations, we had direct voices, that is spirit voices talking from the air, we were touched by the spirits. We saw a whole range of phenomena which could not be mistaken by three investigators such as ourselves. The full range of phenomena produced at Skull was extraordinary. None of the investigators had ever seen anything like it before. The Skull Group also invited guests and independent investigators to scrutinise their sessions. These included scientists from numerous disciplines and even a professional magician who was well trained in spotting evidence of deception. One of the scientists was the internationally renowned biologist and author Dr Rupert Sheldrake. Science has done very little to investigate the afterlife or reincarnation. Most materialists assume that both of them are impossible. So, there's a kind of dogmatic denial by some scientists of the possibility of these things. But I wouldn't say that was a scientific understanding. I would say that was a dogmatic, ideologically motivated dismissal. Um, the only way to have a scientific understanding is to do the research and to find out what's actually happening and to look at the evidence. In 1995, the SPR began their two-year investigation into the Skull experiment. Their initial claims were that they were in contact with a group of deceased entities who were producing, with their help, a number of pictures of either deceased persons or strips of films uh, which they claimed to be produced without any cameras and in the dark. Our main object was to produce these films under conditions which eliminated any possibility of hoaxing. So we would buy the film ourselves, uh, we would load it into a box. The box was held in the hands of the investigators so that no one could get at it. And then immediately afterwards we would take it out of the box ourselves so that no one else touched it and then develop it ourselves in a special machine. Despite all these precautions, the experiments continued to produce a variety of remarkable images. They were able to achieve whole lengths of film, sometimes up to as much as four feet, with various words, symbols, messages, all sorts of different things on that film. The content of the films varied greatly, as did the languages they contained. For example, when a German-speaking investigator was present, a poem in German appeared on a sealed film, not in modern German, but in a dialect spoken well over a century ago. Other films contained fragments of Greek, 
French, Chinese, Hebrew, Latin, and even Sanskrit. The investigators believe this to be significant, since the members of the skull group had no real knowledge of these languages. Many of the messages received at Skull appeared to be deliberately crafted to appeal to the interests of the investigators. But some of the messages were arcane, cryptic, and difficult to understand. If deceased personalities were producing these images, why would they use complex puzzles to communicate? Providing something which is a puzzle, which is difficult to solve, is simply because it is difficult to solve, it isn't readily available, it can't be easily attributable to the person sitting around the table. Despite lengthy investigations, the possible authors of what had been written on some of the films, like this German poem, proved impossible to trace. But others were easier to track down. This one contains a poem by Frederick Myers. Intriguingly, Myers was one of the founders of the SPR and a lifelong researcher into the evidence for survival. Before he died in 1901, he promised his colleagues at the SPR that he would try to communicate with them from the other side. Could this film be an example of such an attempt? In some cases, clues hinting at the possible identity of the authors appeared in the form of signatures. Hidden in a corner of this film strip, which references Meyer's poem, are also the signatures of a Victorian medium, Cora Tappan, and a Will Rawlings, whose identity remains a mystery. However, the identity of the person behind this signature seems clear enough. It appears to belong to the famous Welsh singer, composer and actor Ivor Novello, who died in 1951. Compare this signature, received on one of the Skull films, with Novello's actual signature. This film strip, which bears a handwritten poem in English, also bears the cryptic signature WW. Could these initials and this poem have been written by the spirit of the famous 19th century romantic poet William Wordsworth? After intensive research, Montague Keane determined not only that the handwriting closely matched that of Wordsworth, but also that the poem itself was a variation on an obscure Wordsworth poem titled Ruth. I think that those pictures can be explained only by imagining that the spirits can project their recollections and images onto a film in some way we can't begin to understand. The only alternative explanation is they are all fakes, and I don't believe that there's evidence that that is the case. Although the mechanism for their creation remains unknown, investigators concluded that they were undoubtedly unique. As far as the photographic evidence is concerned at Skull, the strips of film, there has, in my view, never been anything like that at all, ever. Encouraged by the success of their photographic experiments, the Skull Group began a series of video experiments called Project Alice after Lewis Carroll's book, Alice Through the Looking Glass. Their stated aim was nothing less than to try and capture moving images sent from the spirit world. The Skull Group claim that detailed instructions on how to position the camera and mirrors came from their spirit communicators. They were told to set up a video camera in the darkened cellar and aim it into a pair of mirrors so that it could see only its own viewfinder. While it was recording, nothing unusual was seen. But when the tape was played back, these remarkable images had mysteriously appeared. We had images on the video, sometimes of what looked like um, a tunnel of light. Other times, spirit faces were coming towards us.
sometimes what appeared to be a doorway moving. Skeptics have suggested that these visual forms might have been created by video feedback. This occurs when a camera sees its own output. However, the Project Alice images were of a completely different nature and would have required sophisticated intervention and special optics to create them, none of which was used by the Skull Group. Needless to say, it is impossible that video feedback was responsible for these images. As to what some of these extraordinary pictures represent, we can only guess, since their meaning was never explained to the Skull Group. This is another equally enigmatic video. It appears to be part of a strange face with moving eyes. Among the investigators who monitored these video sessions was a Swiss lawyer and businessman, Dr. Hans Scher. He imposed his own security protocols on the experiments we were doing with the video camera. We spoke to Dr. Scher at his home in Switzerland. There's absolutely no possibility that this film could have been prepared before because I selected one of the video films which was in its original packaging which I opened, I took the film out, I signed the film, and I put it personally in the video camera. He inserted it into the camera. We never touched, at any stage, um, the camera or the film. When we played the, the film, it showed at the beginning a number of bubbles of various colors. But there was one particular bubble on there in which the face of a person appeared and it was a man with spectacles. Although Dr. Scher did not recognize this face, the Skull Group believed it might have belonged to someone who was trying to communicate with him from the afterlife. At a later time, a few video experiments were attempted in full light. Once again, nothing unusual was seen during the recording. However, on playback, this appeared. During the Skull experiment, the claimed spirit communications occurred mostly through the mediums. But the Skull Group say they were also able to open up other communication channels as well. This skull. This skull. Some of these were quite surprising. One way that we also communicated with spirit, and which was a very effective way, um, was by use of an ordinary, very cheap tape recorder whose amplifiers were used by the spirit team to carry on a two-way conversation with us. Prior to using this cassette recorder in the sessions, the Foys removed its built-in microphone. This eliminated the possibility of recording human voices that might have been mistaken for spirit communication. Nevertheless, when the machine was activated, voices could be heard emanating from its loudspeaker and two-way conversations conducted. These were picked up by a separate recorder that operated continuously during all Skull sessions. According to the Skull Group, the Spirit Team often proposed new experiments, as well as refinements to previous ones. For example, they provided information to Professor Ellison on how to build a device for improving communications via the tape recorder. The device included a small crystal of germanium, a semiconductor often employed in radio receivers. When Professor Ellison asked for more information, his questions were answered promptly by the spirit team via the mediums. The communications, we hope, will be received in some way on your side 
things yeah. through this germanium. The germanium will be used as a focus. The spirit team explained that they were not working with electricity as we know it, but with an analogue of electricity that is common in their realm. Don't fall into the misunderstanding of dealing with electromagnetic waves because we are not. When completed, the germanium device was plugged into the microphone input of the tape recorder. For a long time we got nothing, there was no results, so it doesn't happen immediately. And then we seem to get something like white noise. And then gradually, these noises sort of calmed down and we heard the odd word. And we encouraged this. It was a breakthrough in communication. I think the spirit team definitely saw it this way. It was part of a plan. They thought eventually this would cut out the human medium so that you wouldn't get people saying, well, this can come from the mind of the medium. When Professor Ellison asked the spirit team how this germanium device could be improved, the answer arrived in the most remarkable way. These images appeared after an unexposed film which had been locked in the security box was later processed by the SPR scientists. The film that we saw had a little diagram showing how the germanium gadget, as we called it, should be modified in such a way by the introduction of two coils and where the coils were to go, with a little description in writing as to why it was going to enhance reception. But who was providing this specialised technical information? The initials at the end of the film may well have solved this mystery. There were three initials, T, A, E, didn't mean too much to us at that particular time. But then it occurred to us that this must be an initial. We were told to look at it for that purpose. And then I wrote to the uh, Edison Memorial people in America and they sent me a copy of one of his letters which contained his initials which looked almost identical to the signature on this film. As well as spirit voices apparently speaking through the mediums and emerging from the cassette recorder, an even more astonishing channel of claimed spirit communication was established at Skoll. We did have some direct voice, um, that's to say, voices which appeared to be coming from right in front of us and which were not using the larynxes of the two mediums. It would come from all parts of the room. Um, over there, maybe some over there, even under the table. Oh, hello there, that sounds like John. Are you under the table? No, you're <laughs> <laughs> you're down here, right. Come up then, come on. I'm down here under the garbage. You're down here. <laughs> <laughs> you all right over there, John? No. No. <laughs> Although most of the communicators using this method wanted to speak to the group, some were less than enthusiastic. Can you tell us your name? They were male, female, sometimes people we knew, family, sometimes just spirit communicators. As it progressed, the voices got better. At first, these voices came haltingly, as if the communicators were struggling to overcome the barriers that divide the living from the dead. I want, I want to, I want to tell you, yes. oh, you need to hurt the mountain, the mountain to climb. Yes, yes you understand yes. that. It became quite clear that there was a learning curve on the part of the spirit team, as there was on our part, because it was an interchange, groping forward to see what they could do. There was a particular communicator called Reg Lawrence, who was an engineer in his lifetime, and who became very expert at producing voices from midair. Lawrence claimed to have lived in the early part of the 20th century. In this session, visiting engineer Walter Schnitger 
asks him how he is able to speak without a physical body and therefore a larynx to form words. Do you see any possibility to describe how we can get the air to vibrate that we can hear it with our ears? We think and concentrate our thoughts. We do not speak. We think in a language we are familiar with. Yeah. In this case, it is our language that we use when we lived upon the earth. Yeah. And by some miracle, I have to say, <laughs> these energies are transported into the room, not by me, but by those whose job it is to do that. The range of physical phenomena witnessed in this small cellar was already astonishing. But perhaps the most spectacular was yet to come. Another thing that happened was that a hand materialised and sort of glowed uh, in the room and there was this disembodied hand floating around. And I commented to the medium, I said, oh, I can see a disembodied hand. And she said, it's not disembodied. This was Mrs Bradshaw who was speaking through one of the mediums. And I said, you mean there's an invisible body attached? And she said, precisely. And then she said, would you like it to touch you? And I said, yes. So she said, well, ask it. So I said, hand, will you touch me? And so the hand went round behind me and it tapped me on the shoulder. And then I saw it moving down and again floating over the table. A hand grasped me and, as it were, um, stroked my left hand. The, the hand was sufficiently visible in the light for me to see the fingernails. Sometimes we would be touched by these hands. Sometimes we would invite them to touch us. Sometimes they would touch us on our knees, let's say, or on our feet, which, as it was a fraud-proof table, were inaccessible to the mediums themselves. So what is it like to touch one of these disembodied hands? It felt um, cool but not cold, uh, it didn't feel clammy, it didn't feel slimy, it felt like a normal human hand, and it grasped my hand firmly. I felt an arm right in front of me moving around the room, and I was so startled, I moved my hand and it traveled right up a sleeve, there was a sleeve, like a cotton sleeve, very much like this, right up to the shoulder, and then it just stopped. There was nothing beyond the sh where the shoulder would have been, it was a really amazing experience. The Skull Group were told by the spirit team that they usually materialised a hand or an arm simply because it was far easier than materialising a full body. But, in some cases, even that was reportedly achieved. I had the presence, the physical presence, of my mother, my father and my sister, all in solid form, standing in front of me, all of whom I was able to, to hold, to embrace, uh, carry out conversations with them. I've witnessed it so many times, it, it just becomes a, a, a normal thing. In some sessions, patches of light would float over the heads of the visiting scientists and then slowly begin to change into spectral forms. The diffuse patches of light would take the form just of a human face, moving round the room with the direct voice very, very faintly coming from the diffuse patch of light and the, the lips moving again very faintly. As I stared at the face, it was noticeably smaller than a normal size head, but within the face itself, features were clearly visible. But then even more remarkable forms began to appear. They looked like angelic forms. Best I could describe them is looking rather like a Madonna um, with a veil. And with robes which, which hung sort of quite well down and they would trail their robes over the hands of the sitters. The feeling of love when this occurred was quite indescribable. This is probably the angelic being. Just unbelievable energy that they brought. <laughs> And I was very fortunate that one came and landed on my hand. And just the energy that you felt from it when it connected with you was 
was a lovely experience and it, it just felt like an overwhelming feeling of love. The touch of those hands brought an extraordinary sense of peace, of tranquility, which we were told was spirit love. Now, I don't like these terms because they sound a bit flaky, a bit off the wall, but it's very difficult to explain it other than the touch of a loving hand. And I found it, far from being spooky, a rather wonderful experience. And I'm, I'm a very cerebral and rather unemotional sort of bloke, but this I found quite uh, impressive. These were great experiences, you see. I, I, again, I must stress, it changes your paradigm. You go in thinking none of this can be true, but after experience, after experience, after experience, it gradually dawns on you, hey, there's something going on here that we can't explain by normal scientific laws, but which nevertheless exists. Skeptics are often unaware of the amount of experience and the amount of knowledge that goes into investigations of this kind. Between the three investigators, you could say we'd had 50 years and more of experiences of this kind. We know all the tricks. I don't see how it could be faked. It's impossible. In my opinion, the skull experience was totally 100% genuine. Despite the investigators' conclusions that the skull phenomena were genuine, Skeptics claim they were produced by the kinds of conjuring tricks used by stage magicians and entertainers. But since professional magicians have spent a lifetime learning all the tricks of illusion, they are also best qualified to detect this type of fraud. With that in mind, James Webster was invited to observe a number of Skull sessions. Webster is a member of the renowned Magic Circle in Britain and has been a professional magician for over 40 years. He is also an experienced investigator of paranormal claims. Well, I had an opportunity to view the cellar. I could see no magic props or anything which made me feel inclined to think there was any hoaxing or, or trickery. I could not do it myself as a professional magician. And I don't believe in any magician that uh, I knew could do even the lighting, let alone the other phenomena that I witnessed. No one in the intervening five years or so has ever produced a whittle of evidence that uh, they were fraudulent or given any indication, any evidence, which suggests that they were not entirely on the level. Any one of those in the cellar, I'd say they were wasting their time doing this here for nothing, when they could be earning <laughs> a million dollars out there on the stage. In the spring of 1997, the Skull Group were invited to hold sessions in four European countries and the United States. Some of the most spectacular sessions occurred in the Los Angeles home of Brian Hurst, a medium who had previously sat with the Skull Group in England. We wanted to see whether it could also take place so many thousands of miles away from Skull here in Southern California. Hurst's converted garage was the venue for eight sessions, with as many as 30 people attending each one. Before each session, Montague Keane and other investigators carefully inspected the room for any signs of trickery. Many people went in at different times before the sessions and there was no, no paraphernalia, there was nothing hidden there at all. Despite being interviewed a decade after the Skoll experiment, these witnesses are still profoundly impressed by what they saw. There was so much phenomena going on, it was really overwhelming. As usual, sessions began with visitors sitting quietly in total darkness. Then, to their amazement, they started hearing the voices of the spirit team speaking through the mediums. You know, in a little while, some of you will be feeling something, seeing something, or hearing something. We just had lights galore. There were hundreds of them. Oh, Isn't that cool? Look at that. Look at that. that wow. Awesome. wow. Yeah. It's like a firefly. Shooting star. Like fireworks. Wow. 
and then it would go up to the rafters of the garage and come down and thunk hard like a big rock hitting the table and then disappear. At one point, a set of wind chimes hanging in the room was set ringing by invisible hands. You could see the chimes because they were painted with the luminous paint. Yeah, I can see it swinging. Wow. <laughs> then the demonstration was modified. You could see them moving without making a sound, and of course that's impossible. The chimes are moving, but they're not making okay. any sound. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's yeah, amazing. Incredible. We had a, a table in the center of the room that had crystals on it. Don't steer too hard, because it might levitate. <laughs> it's moving. The table is indeed levitating. The table levitated, was turned on its side, and began to spin very rapidly. The crystals never fell off. Even if there hadn't been crystals on the table, it would have been impossible to have turned the table sideways and rotated it with the speed at which it rotated. And we could see this because there were luminescent strips on the table. And it began to spin around actually so rapidly it almost looked like a pinwheel. As well as the usual members of the spirit team, other voices the group thought belonged to deceased relatives also attempted to communicate. Someone for Shirley. Yes. Dad. Speak to him. Hi, Dad. How are you? Oh, oh, I love you. Wonderful. I love you very much. I really do feel that um, my dad came and he was the one who put his hands on my shoulders. Oh. Um, the way we were situated in the room, my chair was right up against a wall and there was no way another person could be behind me. Another materialized hand appeared, but who did it belong to? Is it Red? Oh, hello, hello, Red. Red. Hello, Brad. Very nice of you to have us here. You're welcome. Thank you. Just touch my hand. Oh, oh, yes. oh, oh my yes. Oh, oh, he's stroking it. It's slightly cold, but it's flesh. Yeah. He's holding hold my hand. hand. May I hold yours? He's shaking my hand. Thank you. Oh my God. Oh, <laughs> Thank you, Rex. You've, you've made my year. You've made mine. <laughs> Ooh, someone's touching my leg. That's Reg. <laughs> Reg, have you been touching the ladies? Nope, you <laughs> As usual, Lawrence did not communicate through the mediums. Instead, the group could hear his voice projected from different parts of the room. Some of the voices were moving around the room, even a high up in the rafter area that uh, somebody would have had to climb up on a ladder to, to get up there, and there's no way that that was happening. We were listening to uh, taped music, and Spirit kept turning it off. Just gone into the tape recorder, <laughs> taking it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Threw it onto my lap. And then people all around the room began to receive cassettes in their hands, like somebody was passing them around the room. They just gave Jill a tape, too. <laughs> I got a tape. You got a tape? I got a tape. As well as entertaining the visitors, the Spirit team also worked on healing them. Has it gone inside you, that light? It's in my chest right now. It goes right there around my heart, and I have a little bit of a heart problem. Wow. <clears throat> It'll fly out in a minute. Yeah. 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 All of the visitors attending the LA sessions were deeply moved by what they experienced. When you walk out of that room, you definitely feel like you've been exposed to something very extraordinary. It was an amazing experience. We actually saw the spirits, and that's got to be positive evidence for survival. We do live on after death. They certainly proved that to us that night. In November 1999, the three principal investigators published their conclusions in the SBR's official proceedings. This extensive volume is now known as the Skoll Report. 
if you take all the phenomena within the whole of the Skoll experiment over two years while we were there, I would say that the possibility of fraud and faking was nil. Although the Skoll report includes theoretical discussions about how individual phenomena might have been faked, its overall assessment is that the events at Skoll cannot be explained either by known scientific concepts or by trickery. Its three principal authors conclude that the events at Skoll represent convincing evidence for life after death. The things that happened at Skoll, the movements of things in the room, the writing on the film and so forth, all seem hard to explain in normal terms, to put it mildly. But whether they prove the survival of bodily death is another question altogether. So, did a team of spirits, as the Skoll group claim, orchestrate these events from the other side? Or could they all be the result of human paranormal abilities, like telepathy or psychokinesis, the claimed ability of the mind to directly affect matter? There's an enormous amount of evidence for the existence of psychokinesis. In the laboratory, we're talking mainly about the evidence of human consciousness on random number generators and very small events that can be totally controlled. There is clear evidence that people can affect things. One of the most famous practitioners of psychokinesis, or PK, was a Russian housewife, Nina Kalagina. Kalagina was able to demonstrate her abilities under strictly controlled conditions in front of a team of scientists. Researchers who investigated her were convinced she was able to do this solely by the power of her mind. So, could the Skoll Group and their visitors unwittingly have created some or all of the phenomena using PK? As an explanation, although it's not more than just simply a label to it, this is psychokinesis in physical mediumship. Whether it is a spirit working through someone, a spirit acting directly on an object, or the medium's mind causing the things to move. Say there were real mind over matter effects going on as opposed to conjuring tricks, um, then how do we know they were coming from the minds of the disembodied people rather than from the minds of the mediums who were sitting in the room? Although there is no definitive answer to this question, the theory that some skull phenomena were due solely to PK from the living seems improbable, since PK produced under laboratory conditions tends to be weak, usually involving the movement of small objects. Therefore, PK from the living is unlikely to explain the huge range and sophistication of phenomena witnessed at Skoll. We simply have a number of clues of information which was extremely unlikely to have derived from the subconscious mind or the conscious mind of the medium. Uh, and the more impressive those are, the less likely it is that you can say that this is an aspect of mediumship. And the more likely it is, it's an aspect of discarnate communication. I think the sceptics regard the possibility of the survival of human consciousness as inherently so impossible that anyone must be rather crazy to believe it. But when you look at the evidence, you have to ask yourself whether you'd be even more crazy not to believe it or to find some alternative explanation which makes any sort of sense, and I haven't found one. There's a dominant materialism in science that grew up in the 19th century. It's become part of the culture of science, but it's really a dogmatic belief system rather than a testable theory. Materialism is the theory that physical matter is the only reality and that everything, including consciousness, can be explained in these terms. Within science, based on a materialist point of view, the mind is the brain. So anything that suggests the mind might be more than the brain goes against the theory and therefore most scientists don't want to know about it. Another prominent scientist not convinced that consciousness is solely the result of brain activity is Dr. Peter Fenwick, a neuropsychiatrist and fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatrists in London. Do we understand consciousness as far as science is concerned? We certainly don't. We understand a lot about the way the brain functions and we understand the reflections of consciousness as is shown by changes in the brain. But how you get from the objective data of the neuronal firing to the subjective data of experience, we have no idea. It is the hardest problem for neuroscience. 
We live in a time when a materialistic worldview is the dominant scientific worldview. And there's something to be said for it. We've learned an awful lot about the material world. But that's just a small part of the spectrum. Dr. Charles Tart is an emeritus professor of psychology at the University of California and one of the world's leading experts in survival research. The idea that survival of bodily death is impossible and that we're nothing but our brains and bodies is really a function of an outmoded view in science, a Newtonian worldview. Now, the Newtonian worldview works very well for everyday events. But one of the most interesting things about modern science, especially when you look at stuff like quantum theory, is that the world is far more mysterious than we think. I mean, we now have experimental evidence of what Einstein called spooky action at a distance, that we can instantaneously affect something in a distant part of the universe. That's really wild. If consciousness has any of the qualities of this quantum level of existence, then phenomena like telepathy or survival of bodily death are probably not so mysterious after all. I'm quite convinced from all my experience, including the experience of the skull experiment, that uh, a consciousness survives, an intelligence survives in some form or other, and that what survives is mind and not anything else, but that mind can create its own environment. Conditions in the afterlife, as we understand them, are that the lower levels of the afterlife are very much like this world, but that they are, in a sense, a world of thought. What you have to remember, basically, is that it, it isn't a physical world. Everything is done by a thought process. So in the next world, the mind of the observer, the consciousness of the observer, helps to create the experience. One of the odd things about survival experiments and survival information is the almost universal agreement that there is a, an immediate review of your whole life when you die and that there's no crime and punishment of the hell and damnation sort, but it's uh, a process of self-revelation, self-education. We judge ourselves, that seems to be the common thing that is said to us, that we cannot hide from who we really are and what we've done, and we look at the whole picture as if a film is playing in front of us and we make a decision, and there is no escape from that. Our true self knows exactly who we are, what we've done, the good and the bad. But what did the members of the spirit team say? Were those who were supposedly deceased able to shed some light on how the afterlife might be experienced? You have to uh, be careful how we say this. There Very are careful. many spiritual... Yeah. Planes. Many yes. spiritual dimensions, okay. maybe. There are many spiritual dimensions. Mm. There are many wonders in the spirit realms that are far beyond even my understanding. The people on the other side uh, say, look, uh, we live in a totally different world in which we have none of the normal senses. We are just minds. And also, time doesn't mean anything. But you down here, you earthlings, can't understand this because you don't have the vocabulary, you don't have the conception to understand it because your world is limited by your three dimensions. Now, I think that is probably true. It's very irritating, but it's probably true that we can't understand this. And what about reincarnation? What did the spirit communicators say about this perennial issue? Reincarnation was a question that cropped up on a number of occasions, and it was always explained to us by the spirit team as being one of the options. We can choose to do so, but we don't have to do it. But of course we're always told that there are various different levels of the next world and that eventually one moves into a, an area which is a formless area, that, that you go beyond form and exist as pure consciousness. One of the most striking experiments at Skoll was a demonstration the group claimed was conducted by the spirit team 
as a visual metaphor for the reality of life after death. This particular experiment was perhaps the most important experiment of the whole series. This crucial experiment was witnessed by the three SPR scientists and recorded on audio tape. During this session, the scientists claimed they received instructions from spirit personalities speaking through the mediums. The investigators were told to place a glass bowl in the middle of the table. As balls of light darted around the room, one of them flew inside a large quartz crystal. The crystal then levitated in front of our eyes, we could see it glowing, and then descended into a, a Pyrex bowl. Then Arthur Ellison, sitting on my right, was invited to pick it up. He picked it up and satisfied himself that it was there and it was glowing and he put it down again. He was asked right away to pick it up again. He tried to and his fingers closed right over it. In other words, it had dematerialised. Then he was asked to pick it up again and it rematerialized in his hand. Can you put your hand into the bowl, please? Oh, I can feel the crystal now. Now this dumbfounded him. This is what finally convinced him that this was real because it couldn't have been faked in any way. And he had his head right over the top of the bowl in order to ensure that no hand or no instrument could interfere with it. Then the experiment was repeated because I wanted to do the same thing. I could hardly believe it and exactly the same thing happened with me. And then on my left was David Fontana, and Professor Fontana insisted on having his go too, and it was repeated a second time. Of course, we were totally amazed by this. Things do not materialise and dematerialise. This is against all the laws of nature. We are trained scientists, of course. We know how the world behaves, and it doesn't behave like that. Well, you really think what we're experiencing now? Yeah. 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 But what had this remarkable demonstration to do with the question of life after death. The spirit team told us that the experiment with the crystal in the bowl gave a good example of what happened when we die, in that the essence of the crystal remained even when the physical part of the crystal had been removed. Our bodies represent the physical part, but the essence of ourselves remains the same. This, if you like, can be termed the soul. Although some researchers continue to question whether events at Skoll represent convincing evidence for life after death, for the three principal investigators, the vast majority of visitors, and the Skoll experimental group, there is little doubt. We do live on after death. They certainly proved that to us that night. pushing the barriers further than they ever been pushed before and I think we just got to the stage where at that time we couldn't go any further. In 1998, after five years and 500 sessions, the Skoll experiment finally came to an end. But the debate about its authenticity and significance continues to rage. The experiences that I've had have convinced me that it is very difficult to explain any of these things by an alternative explanation to that of survival. But it's a wonderful debate, and of course there are both sides to the argument, and scientists love to debate and they love to argue. But having spent a lifetime investigating the evidence for life after death, the Foys and Bennetts see no need for more debate. I mean, I think the spirit world is our true home. I think this is really where we come for our experiences, our life experiences, and I think when we shake off our physical body, then that's our true home, because we are spirit. I hope the significance of those experiments will literally be to make people think, to stop and think, and look at their own lives, to look at where they're going. And if, if that's all it does, then that's wonderful.
Although the Foys and Bennetts continue to explore physical mediumship separately, to date the extraordinary results they achieved at Skoll have yet to be repeated. Nevertheless, the legacy of their remarkable accomplishment endures, and for many it remains the best body of evidence ever assembled for the possibility of life after death. I can't emphasize enough how this is one of the most important questions that a human being can ask. It would make a major difference in how you lived your life if on the one hand you knew the evidence said no survival, and on the other hand it said probably survival. We should be devoting enormous social resources to this question, not leaving it up to a matter of belief.